All right, so what I'm going to be talking to you guys about is probably the ultimate test that any of us will ever have as Christians, because it's about self-denial. Like, literally, self does not exist. So your own interests, that sort of stuff. Um, I think greed is one of the ultimate tests. And many of us in Canadian society, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, there we go, we're failing it. Because basically, Canada's debt record is off the scale. What we've got is Canadian household debt has just reached 171% of your after-tax money. That, that's household debt. Oh my gosh. That's one of the highest levels that it's ever been in history. Also, this is the average Canadian has $27,131 of consumer debt. So that's not mortgages. That's not anything else. That is cars, nice clothes, iPads, TVs, all that sort of stuff. That's after-tax money. Right now, we haven't even gotten to tax-free day in Quebec. On June 16th, you will have worked every single day this year up to that point just paying your taxes. After that, you get to... On the 17th of January, of, uh, not January, of June, you get to keep your first paycheck. Wow. Okay, now, you work all that time, then you can start paying this off. This is after-tax money. That's about $50,000 of basically pre-tax money. That's for average Canadian salary. That's more than one entire year that you're working and you're in debt because you bought too much stuff. Okay? Incidentally, the references are down there at the bottom. Um, delayed gratification. Stanley talked about the marshmallow test. You know, the, the ability to wait. We're terrible at that. Really, really terrible. Like... I had, ooh, there it is. I want it now. Now, 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 now. What? Uh -huh. No. Does anyone remember the good old days when you ran out of money and you stopped spending it? Like, like, come on. So, personally, I think a lot of people in North America have a very skewed idea of what they need versus what they want. I need a Ferrari. No. You need food, shelter, and like clothing, you know, that sort of stuff. You don't need the internet. You don't need a smartphone. All this sort of stuff. It's an option. Another one. Entitlement. I deserve it. Oh, really? Well, I work all year long, and I deserve my two-week vacation in the Bahamas, or I deserve my cottage. I deserve living in this area. I deserve this. I deserve my, I don't know, Tim Hortons, whatever. No. No, you don't. Kind of time to put on the big boy pants and have a little responsibility and pay your bills first. Like, what do I teach my son? Work first, then play. And then we get to be adults and then we're like, woohoo, play first. No, no, that, like, what I, I'm not advocating. Anyone in the room feeling guilty, like, oh, staring at your shoes, walking out of here today, you know, I, I spent too much money or whatever. What I'm advocating here is discernment, self-control, and starting to think about your money 
in a godly way. It's one of the biggest tests you will ever have. What are you going to use your money for? Self? Me, 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 me? Or are you going to use your money for like a godly goal? Give me more gold, give me more faith. If I put $100 in the collection plate, it's very easy for me to think about that $100 in a very tangible sense. Right? That's $100. I can buy X, Y, Z. But if I put it in the collection plate, give me faith, God, that you're going to multiply this. Not for me, but for a righteous purpose. More gold, more faith. It's not that easy. Right here, some of the clever solutions for the problems of modern living. Notice, problems of modern living. People got along just fine without all this stuff for a very long time. Telephones, dishwashers, electricity in the home, cars, laundry machines, radio, computer, television, credit cards, automated bank machines, VHS, for those of you who are older. <laughs> Right? The internet. Smartphones. Right? Ask someone that's fleeing from a war zone what their need is. Like, I have every single thing on that list. But I'm not possessed by my possessions. I have a, like, I remember when I was, I was a student, and I was taking a shower in my turquoise green tub. It was, it was nice. <laughs> and, and I had like hot water on me, and I was like, oh, I'm a rich man. <laughs> and it's true. Shower, warm place to live, drinkable water, toilet. Food, clothing, I'm a rich man. And, that, and I was a student, I've never been quote unquote poorer in my life. But you ask someone that's fleeing from a war zone, what are they going to take with them? Wife, kids, food and some money. They're not going to be going and taking, oh, I, whatever. Maybe you'll grab the photo album, I don't know. But you're not going to be grabbing for many other things. People's priorities are going to shift real fast. What I would like is to try to get people to think about those priorities, recalibrate how you think on a daily basis. This graph right here, this is Canada's mortgage debt as a percentage of GDP. And what that is, is the gross domestic product is the value of every single thing that was bought and sold in the country in the whole year. Now, you can see here, and if you can read this, in, in 1950, it was at about 14%. Basically, make a long story short, people didn't really have mortgage debt. Because before 1950, before basically the rules for mortgages and stuff were relaxed so people coming back from the war could afford a home, um, if you were to get a mortgage, you would have to put 50% down. The mortgage typically only lasted for five years. You made interest-only payments, and then at the end of that five years, you had to pay the entire rest of the lump sum. So it was only the, basically the super rich that could get a mortgage. The rules changed after the war. Now, with, if you saved up 25% of the value of your home, you could buy it. You could get a loan from the bank, and then you could go purchase your home. Rules over time got relaxed, and what happened? 5% minimum down payment. Now, what people are doing 
is they're looking and they save up their $5,000 or they save up whatever 5% is of the house they want. And then they're like, I can afford this. No, you can't. You're borrowing money for that. What do you think this has done, this trend right here to the price of houses? It's only increased the price of houses. Personally, when I see that, well, incidentally, this is the new value. And I see a bunch of lemmings jumping off a cliff. When in 2015, that rate of debt to GDP is just going straight up almost. And what that means, if, for instance, if you were to take our economy, you hear that we get, oh, we had like a you know, good year, we had 4% growth. If you were to take out all of the money from debt, you would actually see our economy is not growing. It's going down. It's going way down. There's, in my personal opinion, a bubble that's going to burst. And it's going to be very unpleasant for some people. If you get a mortgage, the bank will tell you you should stay within about 32% of your salary, should, that should be your entire house. All your household expenses. Should that be the same for us? If you're going to give to the church, or God, can you make your house 32% of your entire budget? I don't think so. My, I own a house, so I have a mortgage, but my wife and I, what we did is we were renting and renting and we were saving and saving and saving and we put 25% down on our house. And we bought a house under what we can afford so we could still maintain basically giving to the church. We could still maintain a lifestyle where we could be generous not only with the church but with hopefully other people and not only that, we're going to, hopefully we're going to be done paying our mortgage much sooner. Um, try to live and have self-discipline. If mortgage rates do go up, a lot of people are going to be in a whole world of hurt. Right here, blending into society. Can anyone spot the chameleon? Right? There he is. We're not supposed to blend in. We are not supposed to behave with our money the way that everyone else does. If, like for instance, biblical standards of purity. If, what's our big go-to verse for biblical standards of purity in the church? Anyone quote it off the top of your head? Ephesians 5, right? Let's go there for a second. Ephesians 5, verse 3. Now, one of the things, we are not supposed to think like society. We try very hard to make sure that we're not being conformed to the way society thinks. And purity, for instance, is an example of that. You know, we don't believe in sex before marriage. We don't believe in a lot of things. And here, I'm going to read this. It says, Ephesians 5.3, it says, But amongst you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any other kind of impurity. Now, most of us stop there. Read a little bit further. Or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Let's read that again, but I'm going to take out the sexual immorality part. Just to, I'm not advocating cutting your Bible apart, but I just want to emphasize something. But amongst you, there must not be even a hint of greed, because this is improper for God's people. Do you think like society? Like, I know for me, there's a battle that I have to strike between being personally greedy, where I, I give my 10%, and then, okay, if I do that, I've got the checklist done. I do that, I'm not greedy. I can spend 
my money on me, me, me. No, no, no. Okay? That's not how it's supposed to work. Okay? You think about biblical standards for money. Are you just going along with the rest of society and spending the way that they do, acting the exact same way that they do? Take a, take a look at, for instance, homosexuality. Same-sex attractiveness. It was not the church that kind of led the charge against stopping the hate against same-sex attractiveness. What an indictment of the church. Like, we still don't have society's views on that subject, but it was society that led, the secular world that led the way on saying, no, we, we need to kind of accept these people and love them. We, as a church, we need to be leaders, okay? In a lot of different areas. So why would we have the same attitudes on money, debt, and consumerism? Like, for instance, Proverbs 22, 7. The Bible says a lot about money. And since God talks about it, I'm going to talk about it. And here it says, the rich rule over the poor. The borrower is the slave to the lender. Okay. How many of you want to be a slave? Well, voluntarily, a lot of us have went and jumped off a cliff, got yourself into debt. I want it now, now, now. No delayed gratification. No ability to discern need versus want. Self-entitlement. I deserve it. And you are not practicing Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be renewed and changed in the understanding of your mind. Couples and finances. Right here. 93% of all couples, money is one of the top two things that they argue about. Wow, okay. Maybe if we had a godly attitude towards money, we wouldn't argue about it so much. Why do couples argue about it? Conflicting spending habits. Hiding debts. Like, for instance, take myself. I had a parking ticket. And it's $87. I was tempted to just kind of go on the computer, pay it, shred. Wife will never know. <laughs> tempted. But I didn't. She knows. Before today, <laughs> like, looking back, like, and she's like, <laughs> you know, no. If you hide, this is, this, is, this is lying to your spouse. It's not being in the light in your finances. And it's giving Satan a foothold for conflict in your couple. Okay? Not talking about finances. If you don't talk about it, planning to, failing to plan is planning to fail. Okay? You have to talk about it. You have to plan. Do you want to be in the retirement home where, you know, they serve, like, basically high school cafeteria food? Or do you want to be in the nice retirement home that, you know, is actually nice? Like, plan your retirement. Not having a financial plan. Thinking you can buy love. Now, I, I know, like, for instance, my dad, okay? Out of a sincere heart, he loves very deeply, and he wants to give. He just wants to make you happy. But don't give more than you can. And my dad's been guilty of that. It's got him in trouble before. Okay? I don't go to sleep worrying about whether I can pay my bills. But according to an article I just read earlier this month, one out of three Canadians do. So who should be responsible for the finances? Both of you. Now, responsible is different than take care of, okay? Um, to my own discredit, uh, historically, I was not really leading my couple in involving my wife in the finances. I just kind of took, took care of it, went off, and it was something that happened, and my wife had very little understanding of what was going on, and it, it developed insecurity. She didn't know what was going on, and then I found myself in the situation where I'm always the one saying, no, we can't afford that, 
and I'm feeling like the bad guy. Well, what I've started to do is involve my wife more in the planning. So basically, going in the basement, here's the computer, okay, we've got these bills, what should we do? And having her make that decision. So, like, if, for instance, I were to die, and I have not done a proper job of involving my wife so she knows how to take care of the finances, my wife and kids are going to fall from the middle class like a meteor. Okay? That's my responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. Because I could be walking down the street and get hit by a meteor. Right? You have no control over your life. So take decisions together. My wife wants to go on a little vacation. Yes, she does. So, so she asked me, well, what, what should we do for, you know, how much should we allow, you know, budget for this? And I asked, no, you come up with a number. You justify, you go away, you justify it, you do all your research, whatever, and come back to me with a number. Well, that avoided an argument over $1,000 versus $100. Like, no, we can't, you can't go on vacation. And my wife would have been upset. I would have been telling her, no, you can't do that. Well, in this way, she's going off, she's formulating, she's taking ownership of that. And then we had a small discussion, well, should I do this or this? And the difference was $100. Having a discussion over $100 is a lot different than having an argument over 1000 Okay? Involve your spouse. Dishes are probably the number one argument for roommates. I don't know. I just, I needed to involve the singles too, right? Uh, so, like, money is probably the number two. I don't know. So, is wealth a blessing? What do you guys think? It's a, this is an ultimate test, but is it a blessing? Yeah. Yeah, it's a blessing. You look at Job. Job 42, 10 and verse 12. After Job had went through all these tests, basically it says here, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. Okay, it's, it's not the only blessing, but it's certainly, I think, biblically, it is a blessing. But... It's a responsibility. How do you use that responsibility? The reason why we have so many manuscripts of the Bible from the first, second, and third century of such high quality is because very wealthy people commissioned scribes to write this stuff out. Like if you even go to the book of Luke, which Luke and Acts was written by Luke, right? And that's, that's a huge part of the New Testament. Look at the very beginning, and you'll see that Luke wrote this to make an orderly account for most excellent Theophilus, a wealthy person who commissioned Luke with his considerable fortune to make this. Theophilus used his money to further the gospel. All right? That is why money is a blessing, because we can do good with it. The heart of money. There's a lot of things here. I, for instance, Ma Mark 12, 41, this is the parable of the widow. You know, I'm, I'm up here telling you, give to the church. I'm the kind of biblical standard that we can get from the Old Testament is 10%. I'm not here to give you a number, but that's a guideline. But we see that the widow in Mark... She gave more, she gave two copper coins, and she gave more than anybody else. Because she gave for sure with the heart. Matthew 6, 21. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Give me more gold, give me more faith. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, and not reluctantly or under compulsion. We're not doing the shakedown to like, hey, you know, you didn't put enough in the plate, you know, like, 
you're going to get kicked out of the church. No, that... Decide what you think is sacrificial and give. It's a test of your heart. Also here, Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free of the love of money and content with what you have, because God has said, I will never leave you. If you are always looking at, like for instance, 10th commandment, right? Do not covet. If you're always looking at what they have, you're never going to be happy. Philosophy of money, Proverbs 9. Better to be a nobody and yet have a servant than pretend to be somebody and have no food. Keeping up with the Joneses right here. How many people are like, you know, driving the nice car, got the nice clothes, and they're just like right on the edge of financial ruin, but they look good, right? I, I heard an expression one time I like, rich people don't drive nice cars, right? <laughs> they're not spending all their money on cars. Poor people spend a lot of money on cars, right? Because they don't have any money, it's in their car. So 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money, keeping with your income, saving it up. So when Paul comes, he can collect it. Well, this is speaking of a lifestyle of discipline. If, you know, hey, I forgot my collect before, but the next week, I double it up. Actually, I forgot my collect once for three months, and then kept forgetting, kept forgetting. But the check was huge. I, kept, I keep track of my income, and what's in that plate at the end of the year, the number says 10%. Um, Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. It's not your money anyways. Here, you may say to yourself, my power and my strength of my hands has produced this wealth for me. Me, me, me. No, no, no. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant which he swore with your ancestors as it is today. God gave you that ability. He gave you that responsibility. Use it wisely. And Matthew 6 and Luke um, 16, no one can have two masters. Either you'll hate one, and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So just to conclude, to wrap things up here, what we need, we've got our little lemon lemming falling again, um, what we need to do is get out of debt. Pay down your debts. Think differently about money. Be disciplined with your money. Practice delayed gratification. Try to understand with a little bit more clarity your needs versus your wants. Stop your sense of entitlement. I deserve it. No, you don't. We're unworthy servants, as the Bible says. Stop practicing this culture of debt around us of, oh, I can can get this house, or I can get this And just keep trying to get the big next thing. Also, involve your roommates or your spouse in your finances. Roommates, only so much, but spouse, definitely a lot. So, here you go. 